Welcome back. The new budget top line adds about $10 billion for the Pentagon, but experts say the increase will only cover the cost of inflation. Pay increases Congress is likely to mandate means less buying power next year for the Pentagon than this year. Frederico Bartels is senior policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation. He's writing about the budget request in the Hill. Fred, thanks very much for coming back on the program. And that buying power issue is what jumped out at me as I read your piece. If the money goes up not enough to cover the increasing costs, that's the problem, isn't it, eating into that buying power? That's correct. And thanks for having me again, Prince. I really appreciate it. Uh, the main thing is not just uh, on pays. It's also on health care costs that have increased consistently throughout the years. In the last 20 years, DOD has experienced around a 1.2 percent inflation, and it is projected to experience around 2.2 for the next five years. So if you're not covering that, you need to find other resources. Uh, if you're not increasing the top line to cover that, you need to find other resources within your budget to cover those increases. And those usually will come from procurement, from O&M, especially O&M, because they are the most fungible account within DOD. Your piece is very fact-based. I'm going to go a little more existential then. If we're thinking about if, if we should be thinking about buying power and we're thinking about top line, it sounds like we also are thinking about inflation and maintaining pace with inflation broadly when we should be thinking about the inflation of the Pentagon's budget because of those special factors that you just mentioned. Am I on the right track? You are, and that's actually the next project that I want to tackle uh, here at the Heritage Foundation just to see where are the actual inflationary drives within the DOD budget? Uh, because it, it's one thing to just accept that as a fact of life, but, but that is honestly not good enough. We, we need to understand where that is coming from and how uh, both Congress and DOD can tackle those inflationary costs. Because if you just assume that we're going to inflate the budget through infinity and so be it, uh, there's going to be a point that there's not going to be enough resources uh, unless you keep running the printers. But then that's a, another fear that it goes to the existential points that you're mentioning. You mentioned O&M a moment ago, Fred, and you write in this piece, fastest way to reduce costs is to cut training and uh, defer maintenance. That sounds like that's what we were doing in the, the uh, mid-teens to late teens that got us to the readiness problem that we had in that time frame. Is this, would this, do you think, put us back in that same situation? That's the, that's the one of the worst case scenarios. I mean, there are multiple worst case scenarios, especially when the budget hasn't been released yet. But uh, that is the easiest and most fungible way to go about finding resources within the DOD budget. Uh, O&M is a one year uh, resource which expires at the end of the year. so. All, if you need to change funds there, it's easier for you to either reduce a, a, an amount of training, reduce the, the time that you're going to spend on, on that training. And the other element is that you can push procurement into the future. So you would free those resources in the beginning of the year and promise that you're going to buy those fighter jets in the future. But that doesn't necessarily always happen, which goes to the readiness crisis that you mentioned around 2017 uh, when Secretary uh, Mattis was testifying about the, the crisis. When we talk about keeping pace with inflation, just, just kind of trying to stay at par, what does that mean for modernization efforts? The Army has its big six. The Navy's talking about fleet increases and upgrades. Uh, the Air Force is looking at, at, at new airframes, new platforms. How much of those things continue to be possible when you've got to maintain the legacy stuff you already have, be ready to fight tonight, and also think about what the fight looks like 5, 10, 20 years down the road? Yeah, that's the main problem that you have. Because if you are going to fund the current plans, uh, even uh, Obama-era Deputy Secretary uh, of Defense Bob Work, uh, he published a piece on War on the Rocks that mentions that that to just to keep up with the current plans, you need a 3% increase year over year. Uh, so if you're not going to have that, you're going to have necessarily change and turn down those plans that are coming down the, the pike. So you will have uh, less resources to execute those plans into the future. You write in this piece, the Pentagon and the White House also need to drive down the cost of operating our armed forces and the cost of health care. The health care piece is separate. I want to focus on the operating the armed forces. Where's the cut? Where are the costs to cut in the budget in order to be able to achieve what you're proposing? 
or is that more a rhetorical point that you're making, Fred? That is a, though, though, that's two things there. It's also one part in, in terms of future study. That's something that uh, I have to spend some time looking at it uh, to see where the there's actual f fat that is not marbling of the meat, uh, that doesn't make the, the meat better. Uh, because there, there's always some excess capacity within DOD because you need uh, to be prepared when there is a contingency and you can't access that one thing that, and if you only have one thing and you lose it, then you're in bad shape. Uh, and the other thing is to see what are the proposals that they are going to move forward. Uh, one thing that I would like to see from them is actually request a, another background that has been uh, demanded by DOD for the last five to six years. Fred, what will you watch as the full budget comes out? Uh, I want to see how they define legacy. Uh, that is the, the, the main uh, point of discussion. Uh, anything that you can think of can be defined as a legacy platform or a legacy system. I personally still use a, a legacy iPhone 8, uh, and nothing that is made in any congressional district can ever be considered legacy for, for that lawmaker. So there is a very fine balance that they need to walk there to see what is actually legacy and how you define that. Fred Bartels, thanks very much for coming on. Great to have you back. Thank you, Francis.